If you are with us for the first time, or maybe the second time, I want to welcome you. I'm taking a break from our exposition of 1 Peter. We have been making our way through that first letter of Peter. And we're taking a break from that, and we're, right now we are in the middle of a, a special significant series. In light of the anniversary of the 16th century Reformation, coming up on October 31st, I'm devoting five sermons, five different sermons, to the five solas of the Reformation. If you're not familiar with what these are, they're quite simple. Sola Scriptura, by, great, by Scripture alone, Solus Christus by Christ alone, sola gratia by grace alone, sola fide by faith alone, and soli deo gloria, which is by God's glory and to God's glory alone. And today, in this third sermon of this series, we come to the third sola, which is sola gratia, by grace alone. In my last two messages, I have focused entirely, almost entirely, upon the person and life and writings of Martin Luther. And what an appropriate person to begin with, since he really is the father of the Reformation, igniting the Reformation in the first place. But there are many other reformers as well. Many, many others besides Luther spread across Europe. And this morning, I want to introduce you to yet another reformer, this time by the name of John Calvin, actually a second generation reformer. On your outline, I give you uh, several points that are going to guide us uh, through this morning's message. And in looking at Calvin and to Calvin, we are not only going to be introduced uh, to the beginning of his life, but also to this third sola, sola gratia, by grace alone. And we're going to let Calvin uh, guide us, turn our eyes back to the Word of God, back to Scripture, in order to understand what God's grace means for us as sinners. Well, who was John Calvin? Influenced by Reformation teaching, John Calvin was suddenly converted by the gospel and to the gospel and to the Protestant faith sometime between the age of 20 and 24 years old. And you have to remember that this was happening to so many others as well. But shortly after his conversion, John Calvin had to flee he had to flee from his homeland in France due to potential persecution there. And while he was on the move, Calvin wrote the first edition of what would be called the Institutes of the Christian Religion. The Institutes of the Christian Religion, which was at first basically a simple introduction to the Christian life, to the Christian faith. And this project started as just a small little book. By the end of his life, it was a very large book. And in fact, I think if he would not have died when he did, it might have continued to grow in length. It was a large book on Christian life and Christian doctrine. And to this day, it remains one of the most important, some would argue the most important, the most important work on Christian doctrine. If you have never done so, I would encourage you to read Calvin's Institutes, or maybe at least an abridged version of them. The Institutes, they not only provide us with a robust presentation of what we believe as Christians, of the Christian faith and Christian doctrine, but they also give us an incredibly clear, straightforward, and really a wonderful book that emphasizes Christian godliness. Calvin has a way of connecting doctrine, what we believe, with our actions and our hearts. 
As a result, the institutes, you'll find them to be very warm and very pastoral. Very pastoral. To get across to you, in case I haven't made myself clear enough, just how important Calvin's institutes are. If I were sent to a desert island and could only take one book, besides the Bible, of course, it would be Calvin's Institutes. But back to Calvin. When Calvin first wrote the Institutes as this young reformer, they were well received and this little book became very popular. It was evident to many very early on that Calvin, though young, was a very gifted thinker and a very gifted theologian, being only 26 years old. He had tremendous potential ahead of him. And Calvin had decided, well, I'm going to go the routes of the academic life. A life up in the ivory tower where he could research and write books for the rest of his life. The last thing Calvin wanted was to be thrust into public ministry. After all, he was shy, quiet. He was better suited for books in the study. God, however, had a very different plan for this young man. Knowing that he couldn't stay in France, Calvin decided that he would go to Strasbourg, which was located along the Rhine River, along the, the border of France and Germany. But at the time, Strasbourg was blocked as France and the Holy Roman Empire were really butting heads with one another. He couldn't go that way to get there. And so Calvin found an alternative route, a route which went through Geneva in Switzerland. And when he arrived at the city of Geneva, Calvin stopped, but he stopped just for one night. That was it. That was as long as he was going to stay for, no more. He was just passing through. Well, word got out that Calvin was in town, and William Farrell, a fiery, red-headed Protestant preacher, heard. He had been instrumental in turning Geneva away from Roman Catholicism and to the Protestant faith. So he found out, in fact, the city, uh, they had reformed to the Protestant faith just a few months prior to Calvin arriving. Pharrell, he knew he was not gifted to be the leader of reform in Geneva. But Calvin, Calvin, he thought, is the man for the job. After all, he had read Calvin's Institutes. What else could be to the matter? So, Pharrell showed up on Calvin's doorstep. He showed up that night and he asked him to stay. Really, he, he didn't just ask him. He implored him to stay in Geneva and to help the church there, which was young and did not yet have a main leader. There was not a chance. There was not a chance Calvin was about to say yes. Remember, he was headed to life as a scholar. When Calvin said no, Pharrell felt as if Calvin was rejecting God's purpose and God's call on his life. Looking back on the event, Calvin writes of what happened next. Listen to what he says here. Pharrell detained me at Geneva, not so much by counsel and exhortation as by a dreadful curse which I felt to be as if God had from heaven laid his mighty hand upon me to arrest me. He proceeded to utter the imprecation that 
God would curse my retirement and the, and the tranquility of my studies, which I sought if I would withdraw and refuse to help when the necess necessity was so urgent. By this implication, I was so terror-stricken that I gave up the journey I had undertaken. But sensible of my natural shyness and timidity, I would not tie myself to any particular office. In other words, Pharrell said to Calvin, cursed be your writing. And everything you do, if you leave this place and do not stay here and help the church reform. Calvin, fearing that, well, maybe he might be going against the purpose of God. I mean, after all, if Pharrell was willing to go to this length, to get him to stay, maybe he's right. Maybe Geneva is in desperate need of reform and I must help. So Calvin decided to stay. One night turned into a lifetime. And though it didn't happen immediately, Calvin became pastor and God used him to reform his church in Geneva and ultimately to leave behind a legacy that to this day, I would argue, is unrivaled. Calvin, his thought and his ministry, his struggle through many very difficult and hard times in ministry, at one point, he is essentially kicked out, and then they ask him to return. This hard ministry that he began to undertake was accompanied by his commitment to preach God's word, to teach God's word, and to put it into writing. Doctrine that children and adults could turn to and live by. And so his thought is so rich and so deep and so biblical that there are really dozens of ways we could characterize his thought. One of them, which I believe is at the very top of the list, or at least it's up there with others, is Calvin's thought, his teaching on God's grace. And what I am referring to is Calvin as a theologian of sovereign grace. So our purposes for this sermon is to come back to Calvin. I want to draw your attention to Calvin, not for Calvin's sake, but so that Calvin can draw our attention to scripture itself, to understanding what scripture says about God's grace, and in doing so, to understand this great doctrine of grace alone. And in, follow, in the following points that I provide you with on your outline, we're going to let Calvin be our guide through Scripture as we come to understand what God's grace means. Now, before we can do anything, before we can really understand God's grace, and this is so true today, before we can even begin to fathom what God's grace means, we must begin with a biblical view of the doctrine of sin. I would argue that many today misunderstand God's grace. They misunderstand it. Why? Because they misunderstand the effects of sin on mankind. And if you misunderstand that, it is very difficult to understand, let alone appreciate and cherish God's grace. I'll give you several points. Number one, we see in Scripture that man is pervasively depraved. Number one, man's depravity is pervasive. The place to begin is Romans 5, and this is exactly where Calvin takes us in his institutes. In Romans 5, Paul connects the dots 
from Adam and his sin to the rest of mankind. In the garden, Adam was our representative. He represented us. So that when he sinned, he plunged the entire human race into sin with him. The result, it's devastating. It's devastating, isn't it? As children of Adam, each and every single one of us, we have inherited Adam's guilt and his corrupt nature. In Romans 5, Paul says that Adam's sin, in verse 16, he says, it has brought all men into condemnation under the very wrath of God, condemned before him. Paul in Ephesians 2 makes this clear as well when he says that prior to Christ, we were what? Dead. Dead. Dead in the trespasses and sins in which we once walked. And then listen to what he says next in chapter 2. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Do you hear that? Children of wrath by nature. This doctrine is the doctrine of original sin. We're not born into this world, as some might tell you. We're not born into this world neutral. We're not a blank slate. We're not innocent. But as those who have not only inherited Adam's guilt, but his depraved and corrupt nature as well. As Calvin explains, this corrupt nature has been diffused into all parts of the soul, making us liable to God's wrath. And it only results in sinful works of the flesh. And boy, doesn't Calvin sound a lot like the Apostle Paul. As those who have inherited this sinful nature from Adam, every aspect of who we are is somehow tainted by sin. We can call this total or pervasive depravity. Now, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we are as sinful as we possibly can be, as if every single minute we walk around committing the worst conceivable possible sin we can imagine. But it does mean that no aspect of our being escapes sin. Our mind, our affections, and yes, even our will, they're all under the power of sin prior to Christ. Calvin writes, the whole man, the whole man is overwhelmed as by a deluge from head to foot so that no part is immune from sin and all that proceeds from him is to be imputed to sin. So depraved, he says, is man's nature that he can be moved or impelled only to evil. What implication does this have for our will? It means that our will is in bondage and slavery to sin. Jesus said in John 8, 34, everyone who practices sin is what? A slave to sin. In other words, sin is your master. You cannot escape its bidding. But here's the catch. Neither do we want to escape its bidding. We don't want to. 
It's not just that we can't. We have no desire to. While we're in bondage to sin, it's a desired bondage. It's a willful bondage. It is a coveted bondage. There is nothing, there is nothing we want more than sin. So, while our will is enslaved, don't be mistaken, it is a willful slavery indeed. Don't be under the false impression that sinners want to come to Christ. But they cannot because, they're, because they are enslaved to sin. That's not the case. No, they not only cannot come to Christ, they don't want to come to Christ. Those outside of Christ want nothing to do with Jesus, at least not in a saving way. They hate Christ. Maybe they don't say it, but it's clear that they have rejected the Savior and in his place, they have erected a God of their own making. And if you are here this morning as a believer in Jesus Christ, you know this was true. You lived this. This was you and me. You did not desire Christ. You did not see him as most precious. You didn't cherish him. And you definitely had no faith in him, let alone seek salvation in him. Instead, we worship gods of our own making. Calvin would say at one point, each and every one of us, we were like little idol factories walking around, making idols with our own hands in our own hearts. Paul says in Romans 3, 10 through 12, all men are under sin. Listen to what he says here. Here he's quoting from the Old Testament. This is Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He's clear, isn't he? Why such, why the focus? Why, why all of this focus so much on our depravity prior to Christ? Why the attention to what we're calling total or pervasive depravity? I want you to see two things. Number one, I want you to see that man is spiritually enslaved, spiritually enslaved and unable to come to Christ or to do anything that would somehow merit righteousness before God. And we saw that last week. But I want you to see that again. We see it here in Romans 3 and so many other passages. But number two, I want you to see, and this is, this is the hinge on which this entire sermon turns. Everything turns on this. I want you to see that God is absolutely just to condemn every single sinner. Absolutely just. Verse 
righteous to do so. (laughs) This is so important. If you do not get this, everything that follows is going to be messed up. God is not obligated to save anyone. He's not obligated to save anyone. No one. He is perfectly just and righteous to leave man in his sin and his condemnation. Isn't this the whole point of grace? Isn't this the whole point? If God is obligated, even in the slightest, then grace is not grace. It can't be. It can't be. No, grace is grace because while we were dead in our trespasses, as Paul said, and our sins, by nature, children of wrath, God being rich in mercy and love made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive. Ephesians 2, 4. This leads us to our second point. Number two, God's electing grace is unconditional. God's electing grace is unconditional. If we can get our heads around this biblical teaching that we in no way deserve God's mercy or His grace, and that God is in no way obligated to us, obligated to be merciful to us, but instead is perfectly just to leave us in our sin, to condemn us, Everything else, including predestination, beautifully falls into place. And that is why I started with depravity as Paul does. God, well, God would have been just to leave everyone in sin and condemnation. He chose. And think back to what we read from Ephesians 1. He chose before the foundation of the world to bestow His mercy and His grace upon some. And how gracious that was. This choice, it wasn't based on something He foresaw in us. How could it be? The only thing to find in us is sin and condemnation. There's no faith. There's no good works. There's just depravity. And if there is faith, it's because he himself put it there. So God's choice is unconditional. And because it's unconditional, his choice is based purely and solely upon his grace and his good will. Paul makes this abundantly clear in Romans 9. Turn to Romans 9. Romans comes right after the book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And Romans 9, chapter 9, is toward the end of of this letter. I want you to look with me just briefly at what Paul says here, beginning in verses 10 and 11. In Romans chapter 9, Paul is going to point us back, Jacob and Esau. Now, why does God, asks Paul, why does God choose Jacob over Esau? Why does he do it? Was it because he foresaw faith or good works in Jacob? Not at all. 
Paul says in verse 11, look at verse 11, God's choice occurred before they were born and had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not because of works, but because of him who calls. And so Paul can then quote from Malachi chapter 1, an astonishing statement from God. What does he say? Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. I hated. Now notice, if Paul is teaching that God's choice is based on something he foresees in us. L listen to this. This is so crucial. If Paul is teaching that God's choice is based on something he foresees in us, then there would be no objection whatsoever. Right? And what's to object about? But if Paul is teaching that God's choice is unconditional, not based on anything in us, then we would expect to hear an objection. And maybe we have made this objection, right? That's not fair. It's not fair. God, This is exactly the objection, though, that Paul gets in Romans 9, 14. Look at verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there any, is there injustice on God's part? There's the objection. How does Paul answer? By no means. By no means. And who does Paul turn to next to show us that God is perfectly just? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Look at verses 15 through 18. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. And then listen to what he says next. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. And then notice how Paul concludes. So then, he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. Let me ask you something. Why is it, why is it so important that our election before the foundation of the world not be based on anything in us? Why is that so important? It's so important because if it is based on something in us, then we receive credit. Do you see that? When we look at passages like Romans 9, and there are so many others, Ephesians 1, what we discover is that God alone will receive the glory in our salvation. And he is jealous for it. We see that in Romans 9. Sometimes individuals like Calvin receive a bad reputation as if the doctrine of election, predestination, led his theology to be heartless and cold and fatalistic. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, it's just the opposite. Belief in unconditional election, sovereign grace, is the very foundation 
It's the very foundation of our assurance and godliness. It's the very foundation. This is not only the case in, with Calvin, but in Scripture as well. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1, which we read earlier. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. In verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then verse 4, Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Why? For what purpose? That we should be holy and blameless before him. In love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Ephesians 1.4 shows us that this doctrine is, is not only the, the foundation, it's it's really the engine which drives our holiness, our godliness, and even our assurance. Skip down to verse 11. Look at verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 1. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. All things according to the counsel of his will. You don't have to turn there, but he, Paul does the same thing in Romans 8, verse 29. He says there that we receive the promise that all those whom God has predestined, he will not only call, but justify and glorify and glorify. As Paul says in Philippians 1.6, God will finish the good work he has started. People, far from being a doctrine of speculation, predestination is the very bedrock on which your Christian life and your future hope is built. It's the bedrock. It's only because God, before the foundation of the world, loved you that you can have all the assurance in the world that He will finish the work He has begun in you. Number three. The Spirit's call of God's elect to Christ is effective. The Spirit's call of God's elect to Christ is effective. So far, we have only looked at what takes place prior to the creation of the world. But there's more to the story, isn't there? God not only predestines certain individuals to salvation by His grace, by His grace alone, but He then sends the Holy Spirit to then call his elect to himself when they hear the proclamation of the gospel go forth. Now, just to clarify, we must understand, and, and here I want you to pay attention to a distinction that's important. We must understand that scripture makes a distinction between what I'm going to call the, the gospel call and the effectual or effective call. Okay, so hang with me for a second and notice this distinction. What is the gospel call? The gospel call is when the gospel is preached to all people. Something that each and every one of us should be seeking to do. Whether it's in evangelism or missions. It's the general call to all people to hear and to listen and to believe in Jesus. It's this general call to all 
this gospel call which goes out every time the gospel is preached or perhaps shared, maybe in a conversation that you have. The gospel is being communicated by your words. It's what we're to do. As a result, we finish speaking. What happens? We watch. Some believe, some reject the gospel. Some resist. The word is proclaimed and is proclaimed to all people without discrimination. Rich, poor, black, white, everyone. And yet many reject it. And we see this. You know this. If you are faithfully sharing the gospel, you know this. But this is not the only call that's referred to in Scripture. There's also the effectual or effective call. This call refers to what happens behind the scenes, what we don't see. Well, the gospel call goes out to all people by means of human beings like yourself. The Holy Spirit is invisibly at work behind the scenes on those who are God's elect. Breathing life into their spiritually dead corpse. He's at work ripping out that heart of stone and putting in a heart of flesh. One that's alive and beats. He's renewing their will. Giving them new affections that they did not have before. Affections for Jesus. So that when they hear the gospel, whether it's proclaimed or shared in a private conversation, when they hear it, the spirit at work inside of them, what happens? They're made alive by the power of the spirit and they believe for the first time. Notice the difference here. The gospel call is general. It goes out to everyone as it should. And it's rejected by so many and so often. But the effectual call, it's specific. It's for God's elect. And it's effective. It's always successful. The gospel call may be resisted, but the effectual call, it's irresistible. And it's irresistibly sweet. To be clear, there's not, with the spiritually dead sinner, there's not a, a cooperation between the depraved sinner and God prior to this happening. No, we're depraved. We're spiritually dead, as Paul says. There's no life to be found. Instead, God alone is at work. God alone is working behind the scenes on that spiritually dead sinner, bringing them to life out of their spiritual death. I love what Calvin says. Here he's quoting the church father, Augustine. He says, very poetically, the human will does not obtain grace through its freedom, but rather freedom through grace. Let me say that again. The human will does not obtain grace through its freedom, but rather freedom through grace. In other words, God does not draw those who are willing. No one is willing. No one, as Paul says. But he draws in order to make us willing. That's what he does. And those he draws will come to Christ. Those he draws will come to, to God's grace 
And his grace does not return void. It will not fail. It won't fail. This effective or effectual call is seen everywhere in Scripture. In fact, it's so pervasive that Paul will oftentimes just throw it in as he's talking about other things. And oh yeah, by the way, you've been called. And he's referring to this call that's successful, that's brought you to salvation. But I want to just give you one example. Turn to John chapter 6. We could spend an entire sermon on John 6, but I want to just spend a moment. John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, Jesus is very clear that he is the bread of life. And that whoever comes to him will not hunger. And whoever believes in him, he says, will not thirst. So there you have it. There's the gospel call, right? Come to me. You won't thirst. You will no longer be hungry. He's not talking, of course, about physical food and drink, but he's using these as metaphors, spiritual metaphors. So there's the gospel call. Everyone, come to Jesus. But notice what happens next. Many Jews grumble against his teaching and they reject him. Why? Why is it that when the gospel, even from Jesus, goes out, some believe and others do not believe? Why? Why why does that happen? Now perhaps our natural reaction, our, our natural reaction to this question is to say, man's free will, right? No doubt, each and every person who rejects Christ will be held accountable on that day of judgment. There's no doubt about that. But this is not the ultimate reason Scripture gives for why some believe and others don't. And this is not the reason Jesus gives. Look at verses 43 through 44. John chapter 6, verses 43 through 44. This is after they have rejected him and are grumbling. Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me No one, unless the Father who sent me draws him. Did you hear that? No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. There it is. There's the effective call. No one, not anyone, can come to Jesus. The only way You come to Jesus as if the Father draws you to Jesus. Now skip down to verse 60. John 6, verse 60. When the disciples heard this, how fitting, right? What do they say? This is a hard saying, Jesus. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? Who can listen to it? Jesus recognizes what they are saying. And he points out in verse 64 that there are some of them who do not believe. Now why? Why is that? Look at verse 65. This is why, he already told them, he's going to tell them again, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted, unless it is granted him by the Father. There it is. Now, keep your finger there, and I want you to skip ahead to John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 22. Again, another passage where many do not believe Jesus. Jesus. 
The key question is this, why don't they believe? So Jesus is going to give us a straight answer. And, and this, is a, this is about as straightforward as they come from Jesus. He often doesn't, doesn't speak this clearly, but here he's just gonna give it to them. Look at verse 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Okay, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. Now wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jesus. Did you misspeak? I mean, are you tripping over your words here? Shouldn't you have said you are not part of my flock because you did not believe? Isn't that what you really meant to say, Jesus? No. He got it exactly right. He didn't stutter. You do not believe. Why? because you are not part of my flock. In other words, because the Father did not choose you, and the Spirit did not call you, and you will remain in your sin, and you will love it and face condemnation. Now, this may sound This, this may sound like a surprise to some of you. And maybe for some of you, this is the first time these verses are jumping out. And I hope so. But what I want to say to you next is that this is actually a comfort for you, Christian, when you're sharing the gospel. It is a comfort why? We do not have to turn to manipulative methods in our evangelism or in our church services like this one. We don't have to go there. Right? No, Jesus tells us simply be the messenger. Speak the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. You are my little means by which the word, the seed is just scattered here and there and everywhere. Spread the seed. We're not told who the elect are. That's not our responsibility. We're not given that behind the scenes access, are we? No, we simply are ambassadors. And we find out after the fact Instead, we, we preach the good news, and then what do we do? We trust. We trust in our sovereign, omnipotent God who is so wise, so just, and so gracious to bring souls that are in darkness to his light. This brings us to the last point, number four. God receives all of the glory in our salvation, all of it. Why is it so important that salvation be by God's grace alone? And why is this such a big deal? I mean, would it be such a big deal if we just had a little part of it? Just a little bit? A little bit of cooperation or a little bit of my human works? For Calvin, and I hope you can see from the authors of scripture, from Jesus himself, it's a big deal because God's glory is at stake in this. Do you see that in Romans 9? His glory is at stake. If God's grace is made dependent on us, if it's conditioned upon us, if God is sitting there and his success depends upon our permission, then man, even if it is slight, receives credit. And God is robbed of his glory. 
for Calvin and for Paul and for Jesus and so many others, this ends up being an assault on God himself. Now, salvation is by grace alone. Because God is to receive all of the glory in redemption. And so it's appropriate to say of Calvin and Paul and others that they are theologians of sovereign grace. And it's a much needed corrective to us today where individuals are so proud of my human autonomy. People, there is not one soul, not one soul saved by grace who will one day stand before King Jesus and say, I did it. There's not one of us that will ever say that when we meet him face to face. No, God does it, and God has done it all. He is the giver. We, as unworthy sinners, are the blessed recipients of his gifts. And God's sovereign grace, it doesn't lead us to pride. It doesn't lead us to pride, but to humility. In the words of John Newton in that hymn that we sung, I think Calvin would have liked this hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved, notice what he says, a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. Let's pray.